Hi everyone, good evening. My name is uh, Ankit, Dr. Ankit Chadha. Um, and I'd just like to welcome, you, welcome all of you to uh, our webinar this evening. This is the first time we're doing webinars for medical students um, rather than students applying to medicine. Um, so we really, it would be great if we could get some feedback at the end, see what type of topics you might like us to speak on in the future and generally how about the webinar went. If anyone can't hear us, just feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, and also the main thing, we want to try and make it as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put in the chat and I'll try my best to answer them. I'm also going to be joined by Aya, who's a third year medical student, who's going to provide tips and advice on research and publications that she's been doing uh, during her medical degree. So without further ado, let's make a start. The reason I'd like to do these webinars uh, because is um, when you are going through the medical journey, a lot of us can get very focused on the initial six years. It's all about the medicine degree, but we often forget that there's a whole career after that, not just F1, F2, but then your speciality training as well. And then finally, when you become a consultant, and that's if you stay in medicine. And the thing is, people can become so focused on just passing their exams and living the university life that they forget the big picture, which is ultimately building a successful career in medicine. And what I have found, uh, I'm now an F2, is that at each step of the journey, it's actually very competitive to get good posts. And if you're applying for a competitive speciality or in a place such as London, there's going to be a lot of other people applying for that. So if you are in the clinical years, and by this, I mean years three, four, five, of your medicine degree, it is a good time to start thinking about other things you can do to develop your portfolio, such as academia and research. And what we're gonna talk about today is the value of publications. Because at each stage, publications actually count for a lot. They try and differentiate you. Your clinical practice surprisingly doesn't actually count towards your applications for a lot of these steps of the pathway. And that's why building up other parts of your portfolio is becoming more and more important. And what I'm finding is that successful people are starting earlier and earlier. And I think the best time to start is during medical school. And so a lot of what we're going to cover in these webinar series as we go along is what I wish I knew when I was a medical student. I'm currently just finishing FY2. So things that we will cover in future webinars is like the reality about the NHS, how it is to work as a junior doctor, what the rotor is like, how you survive night shifts, but also other things that you might not really appreciate the value of, such as the huge opportunities for research. A big thing that I'm currently finding is a lot of my colleagues are taking time out of medicine. And so a medicine degree doesn't mean that you just have to do clinical medicine. So we will cover that in future talks. But they're also the positives that, you know, if you ever are thinking about leaving or, you know, we often hear only about the negative aspects of medicine in the news, it is still is a very respected career and you are guaranteed a job. And one of the points of this webinar is that medicine doesn't limit you. It, in fact, opens many doors. And one of the things I'm going to be talking about is the value of the SFP the, or the Specialized Foundation Program and how you can use that to your advantage. So just to quickly introduce myself, my name is Ankit and I studied medicine at the University of Cambridge. I secured an AFP post at Northwest London in obstetrics and gynae at Hammersmith Hospital. I'm currently finishing FY2 and I'm currently working in emergency medicine. So I was working the weekend, I've got a day off today and I'm on night shifts from tomorrow. And you can follow my journey by following the Intermed account on Instagram. And next year, I'm gonna start internal medicine training at Wexham Park. And what I want to do is clinical oncology. And I'm the founder of Intermed and basically built up this website, the notes and the resources. And we're trying to now increase awareness of that. So in today's agenda for this talk, what we specifically wanted to talk about is about why research is so important. And it does link in to the changes to FPAS applying to foundation years, which you may or may not be aware of. Then we'll go into the different types of research that you can get involved in as a medical student and then key tips on getting published because it is actually quite hard and having one or two publications can really make the difference between whether you are successful for an application or not and then i will talk about some other opportunities that you may not know of 
that you can also get involved in as part of broadening your academic portfolio. At, we'll have regular intervals for questions, but there'll also be a Q&A session at the end. So the first is like why research is important. Now you might or might not be aware. So when I was applying for foundation years, you used to get a score out of 100 and that would determine where you're ranked and then you could choose your jobs in the country. That system has now been scrapped. So 50% used to be your deciles, how well you do in your year academically compared to your colleagues. You'd get two up to two points for publications, up to four points for additional degrees, and that would make the first 50. The second 50 points would be about how you score in the situational judgment test. Now, whether you think this is a good thing or a bad thing, but that whole system is being scrapped from next year. Um, and there's not going to be the 100 points. Instead, it's a new type of algorithm where people will basically rank their preferences. And the algorithm is designed to allocate as many people to their top preferences as possible. But sort of the issue with that is that what we can foresee is that a lot of people will probably be applying for places like London or Oxford, which are really competitive places. And the demand will far outweigh the supply. And so in that, there's no real, it's, it's basically random chance after that, whether you are allocated one of those places. So according, whereas in the previous uh, system, you could try and maximize your chances of getting a particular place by boosting your rank, for example, by doing publications, additional degrees, doing very well. And for this, there's a separate application process. You have to fill in an application form, do white space questions, and there's an interview as well. However, one of the main benefits of this now is that it's the only way to guarantee where you will actually be next year. And I think for the type of mindset that I had, it's like you can have a goal. If you perform well, if you get a good application and perform well in your interview, you know where you want to be. So you're kind of taking chance out of the equation. And the value of this is, so as you can see here, sorry, this is just a screenshot, that the academic foundation fits into a rotation, but then it opens doors later, then do more academia, do a PhD, which is becoming more important to get consultant jobs, especially in competitive deaneries. Apart from just knowing where you're going to be, there's several advantages that I have found by doing the academic foundation program this year. So the first is actual more annual than study leave. In each of the four month rotations, you get nine days. But my research program was basically work from home. So I got to spend a lot of time, you know, if I did want to do some work that day, you work on spreadsheet data collection, I had a much more flexible schedule. I got to go on more holidays. Also, if you're an academic fellow, you get much more study leave and people will understand when you want to attend conferences. And next week, I'm going for three days to Aberdeen to present my research at an oncology conference. Another benefit is that it's an earlier application process. You will find out where you are in January, whereas everyone else finds out where they are in April. And that gives you three extra months to prepare for stuff like uh, house hunting and just basically get your life in order in that transition from university to working life. Research experience, obviously, is an academic foundation program. And if you are interested in academia, it opens all those research doors to do a PhD later in life. And by a lot of these places, it's hard to get into to do a PhD. But by starting early, you get to know everyone and then can have those networking opportunities. You also get time off the wards. And a lot of my colleagues are now taking F3s time out to um because the two years has really burnt them out. Whereas I've come back after four months quite refreshed. 
Um, and so I don't need to, that's why I'm applying straight on. You also get more time to do your exams. And I've done my two sets of professional exams during this time. Um, and you can also apply to specific areas as we discussed uh, earlier. And it's much easier to get publications as you will have researched your own data collection that you can then write up for future applications. Um, and so what I wanted to check and uh, go through in this is that applying for the AFP has also changed. This is the criteria, um, the shortlisting criteria for London. And I appreciate it is slightly different for different deaneries, but most of the scoring is fairly similar. There is a significant emphasis on publications and presentations. Your decile, how you do in the year, doesn't really matter anymore. And in terms of prizes, the prizes are so vague that everyone who is applying will usually be able to think of five prizes for points. So the main differentiator in this section is publications and presentations. And this will make the difference between securing an interview and not. One of my colleagues, she basically scored the highest points um, out of 100 in our year, the highest SJT score and got 40 out of 50 in the EPM. But because she didn't have one publication, she didn't even get an interview for the academic foundation program. And that's such a shame, but it just shows you that this is going to be the difference. And the value of this is, so for each publication, you get two um, points. And then if you present that orally or at a poster presentation, you then get an extra point. So what we're really looking for is to get a publication and then present it um, at either an oral or poster to get three. And you have to, if you can do three of those, you're going to be in a very good um, position to getting an academic offer. Okay, so that's basically the introduction. Now I just wanted to go through uh, the types of research. I understand that uh, we've had a couple of questions. Will, will we get the recording? Uh, you can get the recording. Um, we'll cover that at the end. It is being recorded. Um, and is the SFP available for all specialities or only select ones? Um, again, with that, no, it, usually most specialities are there, but you have to look for the deanery. And anyway, we'll carry on for now. So into the types of research. Okay, so there's many different types of research that you can get involved in as a medical student. And when you are applying for the AFE, you will basically have to know this pyramid off by heart. Not just the type of studies, what they do, what they measure, the advantages and disadvantages of each type of study. Fortunately, I have written a course on applying for the Academic Foundation Program, which goes through in detail all of this, but we'll cover that at the end. Um, and as you can see, there are lots of types, but the key thing is you have to remember you are doing a medicine degree. You are also going to have lives outside medicine. So trying to do stuff like this is going to be very time intensive and you may not get it done. So starting with the different types of research you can get involved in. This is what I like to call standard research, and it, it is the best type. So I'd describe this as a lab based or clinical project, and it will involve Proper research is you have a clinical question, and the key thing is that involves a period of data collection. This may be, for example, if you're working with animals, you'd be looking at certain variables. If you're working with cells, if you're working with patients, it might involve doing surveys and stuff to collect some data. And then it involves statistical analysis and paper writing. The important thing with this is that it usually does take a long time, especially if the data collection hasn't even started. And so I've been caught out with this at medical school as well. I started a project in about fourth year. The data hadn't been done. It took two years to collect that data. And then more people get involved. Then you start analyzing it. Then you realize you need to collect some more data. Three years later, we weren't anywhere closer to publishing it. And by the time I'd started work and I basically had to drop it. And I'm still sure, and I'm sure that data is still sitting somewhere which hasn't been analyzed. If you can get it done, it is. it does look really good. And so the things that we'll cover later in terms of the tips is getting a project where the data might already have been collected. Ideally, in your portfolio, it would be good to have one type of this standard research in your portfolio. And I think the best opportunity for that is doing an intercalated degree, because usually in that you'll have a research project where you can collect some data. The next type of research that I think you should all get involved in is a literature review. And this still counts as research. It's still the same number of points. 
And what it is, it's a review of previous studies and literature. Now, if you're asking a very generic question, this could be huge and take, you know, there might be thousands of papers published on this. But if you're looking for a more niche thing that maybe there's not that much evidence on, this can actually be quite easy. So what you have to do is go through, trawl through previous studies, and you can uh, compile those, do a commentary on what each study shows, and then an overall conclusion of what the majority of studies are showing and where future research should lead. This is much less time consuming, and it doesn't even have to involve any data analysis. It involves a literature search, evaluating sources, doing it, and then writing up your literature review. I've published one of these. It was a psych literature review, and I generated a hypothesis. I don't think it's particularly correct, but the research paper liked it. Um, and it was just a synthesis of a few studies about anxiety and autism, and um, th that got published. If you want to go one step up, and again, I'd be aware of this, is a systematic review. Now, this is also a review of previous studies and the literature. However, the difference is that it's systematic. So you have to have very, very specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. For this, you will have to use proper um, research software like PubMed and other journals, and you will specify what the, re what the search terms are. Once you then do that, you will have to screen the studies and then exclude ones which are not in your inclusion criteria. Then you can take out the data of each, and you can also combine this with what's known as a meta-analysis, and that's a statistical analysis, taking the values from each of the studies to get an overall result to see what the likely conclusion is. These systematic reviews can take a lot of time and involve a lot of effort. And so what I'd recommend with this is that there will be a lot of systematic reviews going on. Someone, might, a PhD student, for example, might be doing this um, full time. You can always assist them with some data collection or looking at it, provided, at, and you can ask them to include your name in the paper when it's published. But embarking on this as a solo effort, I think, will be very difficult. The next type of research, I would say, well, this is not technically research, but it does come under the same banner of quality improvement is an audit. This is, becomes especially important when you do start working as junior doctors because you're expected to do one every year. And what it is, it's more a service evaluation. You are evaluating the standards of a service. For example, you could look at how many, what percentage of patients um, attend on time or have the correct paperwork done when they attend a clinic. You're comparing that to a standard once you then have it, you can then implement a change. So if it's only 70%, you can then, for example, do a presentation. That's your intervention in, in the act thing um, to basically explain to the people what the reasons are that they're not getting the proper paperwork and educate the clinicians. And then you can re-audit to see if that has gone up. Now, although that's not research, these are very important because you're demonstrating you're helping you know, improve the quality of the NHS and the local systems. And you can then write up that audit and even publish that in a journal. So whilst it doesn't technically count as new research, it's still something that you can get involved in and it's not too difficult to do. And the best place for these that I have found is when you're on your GP um, surgery rotations, because GPs constantly need to do audits every year. And there usually will be an audit lead. It may often be the pharmacist. If you go and speak to them, they'll be able to help you get involved with some um, service evaluation and an audit. And the bonus is if it is um, published. Here's another one, which I do find quite funny. So this is a letter to the editor of a journal. Now this isn't, you're not doing any literature reviews on your own. You're not uh, doing your own research. Instead, it's a commentary about another piece that has been published. For example, someone could have done a literature review or someone could have done a piece of primary research. You could then, and, and come to a conclusion, you can then respond to that. And it literally only has to be an A4 um, length um, letter and basically be like, that, you know, comment on that, that it was very interesting results, but maybe have they considered that other view, maybe point out some flaws in their studies or something that they might want to consider. And that will be published in the next journal. And a lot of places will accept that because it will have a PubMed ID. 
some deaneries for the academic foundation program may, long, may no longer accept it as a publication, but a, a few or a lot of them still do. And therefore, I think it's good having a couple of these under your belt, if not only for the SFP, but for your overall academic portfolio. Sure. So we're just going to have a quick pause there. And I just wondered if anyone had any questions on things so far. OK, so we have a couple um, coming through. So the first is, does it matter if you're not a first author in publications? Um, so I, at the pub, at the F1 level, I don't, it doesn't really matter if you're first author. Going forward, it is a good idea to have a couple, um, at least one where you're a first author in publications. However, you'll find that there's often a points distribution. Like, for example, you might get seven points for being a named author on a publication and eight points for being the first author. So the differential between being a first author and not isn't that high. But as you saw it for applying to the SFP in that table, it didn't matter if you were first author or not. It's just whether you had a PubMed published publication. How significant do you think the choice of a journal um, is for publishing a project? So I think the choice of journal is very important. Again, at your level and when it's taken into all your portfolios, unless you're becoming a professor, the impact factor of the journal doesn't make too much of a difference um, because they are just um, interested in whether you are published or not. To be completely honest, my um, research paper, my psych research paper and anxiety, the first one I published, was published in, I think, a Bulgarian journal which is PubMed registered, but the impact factor wasn't too high. Sorry, it's the allergies. Um, however, it gets equivalent points to a, to a paper that's published in Nature, for example. My other one was published in the Journal of Effective Disorders, which has a much higher impact factor. So I think definitely if you're struggling to get any publications, I wouldn't be too picky. The value between having a publication and not is actually huge. And I wish I'd known that sooner. I don't like to think of medicine as just ticking boxes just for portfolio. But unfortunately, when they have made the game this way and made it harder and harder to go through it and get the place that you want, unfortunately, you, you do have to start thinking about this in the back of your mind. OK, we're going to go on onto the tips on on getting published. And these are some that I've picked up over time that I'd just like to share. OK, the first, I think the most important one is learning to say no. A lot of people will approach you at medical school, whether that be at your GP surgery or registrars or consultants or even other students and ask, can you just help on the data collection? And they might even you know, entice you that you might get a publication at the end of this. But I would go back to you know, what we've covered, the types of research, find out what type it is. Is it a systematic review? Is it a piece of primary research? Has the data even been collected? Is it something that someone wants to do? Has they even, have they even gained ethical approval? Most projects that I found take a long time and almost never get published. People are doing it and they just want to do a bit of research to present at a local departmental meeting to meet their target. And then they forget about it. So you have to learn to be selective. It's very hard once you have said yes to then back, back out of it later. And not only are you wasting your own time, you are pr probably distracting from a good opportunity that may come out later. So that's why I think it is, um, you know, learning to say no is very important and learning to be selective will help you. You can always say no, or I'd like to think about it, come back and then say yes, because ultimately people are going to be very happy. And when, and it is very okay when you are having those initial discussions to ask, will this be published? Where will it be published? Will you get your name on it? Because no one expects free work for nothing. Um, so going through it, I would recommend either doing a literature review or getting involved in research where data has already been collected. At Cambridge, we had an SSC, which is like a six week research block. Six weeks is not long enough to start and complete research. And that's why my supervisor gave me pieces of data that had already been collected as part of another study 
but they wanted to ask a different question. And I managed to do that analysis very quickly and write it up. And that was the paper that was published in the Journal of Affective Disorders. Okay, the next one is speaking to your supervisors. Um, and I would do this, I would pick people that you have a good relationship with you. And there's two reasons for this. One, your supervisors will probably want to help you. And secondly, they, pro they will have been in the same situation as you. I've been a medical student trying to get research. And now if I was getting involved in research and someone asked me for some help, I'd try and give them honest advice. They are very keen to help you in your portfolio. But the other thing is they will often know the best ways of getting published. And that might be applying to specific journals that they might even know the editor of or applying to journals that they know that are looking for certain pieces of evidence or where the process is already streamlined or whether they've got the funding to apply. So having these discussions is actually very important. And I think, you know, coming into September, it's the start of the new year. If you go to your supervisor and say you are interested in applying for the Academic Foundation Programme, they will know that it is a very competitive programme and it's going to help your career going forward. So they will know that you need to display evidence of academia and research and publications. So I'm sure that if you explain it to them in this way, it will help. The next thing that I would do, and it might be a, a late for some of you in this talk, but if we have a few people in the earlier years um, who might be considering whether they want to do an intercalated degree or not, I still really see the value in this. I did an intercalated degree in psych, and both of my publications are from my psych intercalated degree. It doesn't count towards your FPAS anymore. However, it really does represent an excellent opportunity to getting published. The other thing I would say is that five years of medical school are particularly grueling. And so a lot of people um, who, you know, after F foundation year one and F2 are taking an F3 to go traveling or some local work because they're so burnt out. And I would argue the same logic in medical school, medical school. You can think of it as your FY3 year during medical school instead. And if you do use it productively, there's excellent opportunities. And you can come back to your clinical thing um, to your clinical work refreshed. Also, if you are interested in a particular subject, and it might be too early to know what type of medicine or surgery you want to do, it does give you a chance to explore that interest further. I think this is one that people often really undervalue. And I, I think the reason for this is because there's this almost stereotype that medical students are very, very competitive and all they love to do is compete with each other. And that might be true in exams, but what, and you might even find that for the first couple of years during your medicine degree. I mean, it, it was like that at Cambridge a little bit, I'm not going to lie. However, as you start coming into the clinical years, and especially when you start working, no one really cares about what you got in this exam, whether you got more than this person or not. Instead, actually working collaboratively will get you a lot further. So if you are doing a literature review and your friend is interested in one, rather than write one each, write half of each one together because then you can both put your name on each other's and it will count as two publications. You can be first author, you know, on each. Um, and then you'll also have opportunities to pr present both. So if you start getting into that framework where thinking collaboratively, it's better to have a, a smaller piece of a much bigger pie than everything of nothing. It will actually serve you a lot well going forward. And I would try and get out this mindset that any work you do is just yours. Because if you do join a research group anyway, on any piece of research that that lab group publishes, the head of the research group will ultimately be the one that gets all the credit. And that's kind of the way it works. So trying to have a less egotistical framework, working with your friends, getting that collaborative working going will help a lot. And you can basically quickly tick off these publications. And the difference between, I think a lot of students who apply for the AFP will probably have one. If you don't even have any publications, I wouldn't even bother applying. But I do. there will be a difference between one and two um, publications. Um, and that might often, that might be the differentiator between getting an interview or not. Okay, so we've gone through quite a lot of information quite quickly there. 
um, so far basically covered, um, you know, where medicine is going, the changes to the situational judgment and applications to foundation med school. Then we've had a thing about the different types of research that were available. And then just some tips that you can do when getting published. I can't give you a publication. If I could, uh, I probably would. Um, but these are just tips that, and, you know, things that you want to keep in the back of your mind that will help you going forward. For detailed advice about the SFP, about how to ace the interview, about how to write your white space questions. If you do like the way I present or talk in detail, then you can check out our course. I'm currently updating it for 20, for this year. So it's not available yet, but it will be available at the start of July. And uh, we'll send you an email when it is available. But I basically wanted to put this together in terms of a medical student. So Aya, I'm going to invite her to speak now. And this is about thinking differently. We've spoken about key types of research. But remember, there's a lot of opportunities there. And even in that point scoring out of 10, it did say, um, you know, two points for publications, one point for an oral or poster presentation. You don't just have to present stuff that you have published. Any presentation, whether it has been published in a journal or not, will still count as points in um, for that um, and still still serve and still serve you well. So you can always bump up the points with presentations on stuff that you may not have published yourself. Um, and uh, Aya, do you want to take over for this bit? Yeah, I just need to get my video started. I think I'm not allowed as of yet. Ah, okay. One second. Um, hold on. One. Okay, just sorry, one second. Technical difficulties. Oops. I'm just going to stop sharing screen for a moment. You should be able to turn on your thing now. Thank you. If you could just, uh, you'll have to share the PowerPoint on your thing. Just give me a moment. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat in the meantime. Okay, so we've had ways of coming up with ideas of topics for research. I think the best thing for this is to ask your supervisor for what they are currently involved in. You might have a very good idea for research, but no one might have the funding to be able to currently do that. Um, so my first, how I got into autism and anxiety, that's what my research supervisor was currently doing. And so he had a lot of ideas in there. It is quite hard at, at, at med student level to think of a research idea that's going to be great. So um, I would definitely look for um, speaking to your supervisors for that. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. I think you're muted. Is it changing? Fine. It isn't. Here we go. Um, I think the technical difficulties are over, so I'll start now. Um, hi, everyone. So Enkit has given you such a good and comprehensive kind of overview of how to actually get involved with research, the different kinds, and why you should do it. I'll give you a little bit of my personal experience now that I'm a third year med medical student and tried to dabble a little bit with doing certain things in academic medicine and stuff. So uh, like I said, I'm a third year medical student. I go to the Hull York Medical School and I'm based in New York. I'm actually an international student from Abu Dhabi. And 
a lot of the kind of the introduction to research that I had in my in the summer of my first year of medical school was through being a laid law scholar. So the laid law scholarship is a national scholarship and I want to talk about it a little bit because it's one of those kind of um, unorthodox ways of getting involved into re in research and doing things a little bit outside of medicine but also tying it really well with your course um, so you can explore everything you can do with your degree and beyond and I thought it was a really good opportunity for everybody to really get involved with so um, the Laidlo scholarship is offered by a few of the universities in the UK and outside of it um, you have to check whether your, your university actually does offer it um, and it is a two-year scholarship where in each of the summers of first year and second year you do a placement and one of those placements is meant to be where you get involved with research um, so my first year placement that i did was based in a biology lab at the university of york i found the supervisor reached out and thought their research was interesting and ended up doing a six-week placement in a lab doing preclinical research um, on immunology. And from that, I, from those six weeks and obviously a lot of work afterwards, I produced a lab presentation report for the kind of for my scholarship and for the lab and also a poster. And in one in this picture, you can see me presenting that poster and also in this first picture here. So that's the poster and that was me totally not nervous presenting it and yeah so I thought that was one of those ways you can get involved with research that is very kind of um, out of the box and it's um, you've got full autonomy on what you do and the kinds of research you can get involved with and you can get a lot out of it even if it's not a full publication um, getting preclinical research to be published is very difficult um, but I gained so much actual in lab experience from that, as well as a poster and um, kind of a, something to present later on, which I'll touch on in a bit. So what you can do with a poster is actually a lot more than you can think, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a publication. Um, so local, regional and national conferences all over the UK and internationally um, are always looking for relevant abstracts. And an abstract is basically like a summary of the work that you've done um, through kind of writing up a research proposal or doing a project um, that might be in the works or get towards getting published um, or something that you found interesting and you did a review on but never actually published it it's, um, or a case study that you kind of saw on GP placement and you were interested and you kind of wrote a bit more about it and now have some sort of research project on that and it doesn't necessarily have to be published or in the process for doing that so posters can be then used as a poster presentation normally like you saw in my previous slide or they can be converted to oral presentations like you can see in this picture here so you kind of create a powerpoint slide deck and you present you break down your research a little bit more and you present what you did, your findings, what you learned from it, your future, the implications of it, kind of answer questions and go from there. So for me, uh, with the kind of project that I did with Laidlaw specifically, I ended up presenting it at a few um, conferences in the UK and my presentations won two awards. So after just presenting it as a poster, I ended up getting the best design for the poster and the poster with the best implications and to clinical practice and people kind of you learn a lot from actually presenting to people and going to those conferences. It helps you network. It helps you learn about different aspects of medicine that you might be interested in. And through doing that, you actually get a lot more insights into what you might want to do. You get insight into what you might want to do research in and you can literally come out of a conference with a whole idea to propose to a supervisor and you can go from there so a good tip for me would actually be to attend certain conferences that you think you might be interested in the topics that they're presenting or the speakers that they're going for um, even if you're not actually presenting yourself especially if it's earlier on in your um, kind of years in medical school because um, you get a lot more 
inspiration from that and I think it's a good way to start if you're completely clueless on what to kind of do or what part of medicine you're really interested in. So other ways to get a little bit more involved um, that I've kind of dabbled in besides the obvious things that Ankit has mentioned before. So there's webinars like this and loads others that will help you know where to start or help you understand a little bit more about academic medicine, the different kinds of research and um, how to actually, for example, write a systematic review, how to um, do a literature review and so on. And you can get certificates for attending those conferences because you learn something from them and you can get inspiration, you can get contacts. Um, there's a lot of benefit in going and putting yourself out there. Um, so equally for those webinars or conferences, you get so much exposure through that and it will help you kind of guide your journey to wherever kind of publication you want to get. Um, so the Royal College of Medicine has a student section and I would recommend joining them. They have webinars that they plan to help students get more involved with research and some of them are really, really useful. Some of them are very tailored to certain kind of niche interests and that might be good for you too. Um, so I will definitely recommend checking them out. Also, that each of your medical schools, there might be a research society. So similar to NeuroSoc or CardioSoc, you can have a research SOC and they might have um, kind of pathways already in place to help you get involved with research. Um, so they might be gathering supervisors and have them ready to match with um, students to then work together on projects and get publications or even just get abstracts or projects going on so that to get you practicing how to do economic medicine. Um, and those research societies are a very good first step if you have them. If you don't have one, maybe start one or reach outside of your medical school if you can. Um, I think like Dr. Enkit said, um, there's loads of supervisors that will be more than happy to help you. And it's always a good idea to just kind of knock on the door and make it just ask the question and more likely than not, you'll get a yes from them. So, and yeah, so reaching out to doctors and academics is a really, really good way to do it. However, I think certain medical schools are better than others for this. So for example, my medical school doesn't necessarily focus on research. Um, the academics there aren't necessarily always involved. So you'll usually get, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm not really involved in this rather than no, I don't wanna help you. So there's a lot of kind of thought that needs to be given to where and who you ask because the person that you're asking should be really actively involved in research because if they are, there is a likely, there is a bigger likelihood basically that they'll be able to offer you a project or offer to supervise a project for you because that's what they do day to day. And it's part of the routine as a clinician. Um, so it would be much better to ask those people. So I would look up the person I'm kind of hoping to reach out to, um, look at their um, like PubMed publications, their accounts, what they're doing, what kind of research they're actually doing right now, what were the publications like from before and kind of go from there. Um, so yeah, and it's kind of scary to start off, but once you send a few emails, it gets easier. So hopefully that was a little useful to some, all of you. And if you did find it useful, we would love if you checked out our SFP course, which will be coming out in due time. Um, and we'll send you emails to let you know about it. And we're updating it soon as well. Um, and we would love a review, like we said. So please let us know what you thought of our webinar. You can scan the QR code and it will send you directly to our trust pilot page where you can leave us a review and let us know what you think. And yeah, that's it from me. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone mm -hmm. as well. I don't think I can turn my camera on, but I don't need to at the moment. I, I can finish this off. It really okay, would be so. good. In terms of sharing the recording, we will be able to share it um, for students who uh, basically leave us a review. So if you leave us a Trustpilot review um, of feedback about how you have found this, then if you give us a few days, we'll send you the link uh, to the recording, um, which will basically include what we've discussed today and, and the slides as well. So that's the QR code. We'll also send an email after 
with the link uh, for the, for the feedback. Um, if you could, uh, it would be great if you could do that and also mention any topics that you think that you might like to get um, anything on. As I said, this is the first of um, hopefully many webinars. Um, if you did enjoy this, or if you like to uh, basically find out um, about, um, you know, basically my life as a doctor working in the emergency department, you can follow our Instagram page. Um, I was just going to post in, uh, or we'll add it on the email, what uh, the Instagram handle is. Um, and uh, yeah, you can follow us that way. And then please do continue to use the resources uh, on Intimed, the notes, the cases, the blogs. Um, and then when you come to applying, if you do find our, my style uh, useful and detailed, then our SFP course and also my uh, PSA course, the prescribing skills assessment will also be coming out later this year. Um, and uh, basically, yep, we'll, we'll go from there. Also on the site, there's a lot of free resources. Um, like we have our free mini OSCE booklet. Um, and if you have any questions at all, please do get in touch. But it's been great having you here. The weather's great, so go and enjoy it outside um, and make sure you make the most of your university years because work comes very soon. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Aya, as well. Mm -hmm.